to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Uh, Pam and Greg, one of the things I liked about the book as a clinical psychologist is that it really picks up on a dominant stream of uh, psychology called cognitive behavioral therapy. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, how that undergirds some of your thoughts about hearing difficult things. Absolutely. Um, Well, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I talk about it in grisly detail in the book um, with uh, more details than I'd ever talked about how badly um, I suffered from depression at the point that I started doing CBT. Um, It's one of those funny experiences that you have when you're writing a book that it almost feels like this is just between me and the computer, and then you realize, wow, okay, I'm telling this to millions of people or or thousands of people. Um, CBT is is amazing in that it's a really effective intervention for anxiety and depression, and fundamentally uh, what it is is looking at your own exaggerated uh, thoughts. And what I mean by exaggerated thoughts, they're also known as cognitive distortions. They're things that everybody does, um, that essentially if a job interview goes badly, you say, oh, God, I'm going to die like in the gutter. You know, um, when you're feeling really anxious and depressed, you have more of this kind of um, anxious, exaggerated talk. And what CBT does is it gives you labels for um, different kinds of common mental exaggerations. So uh, I'm going to die in the gutter is catastrophizing. Um, You know, if you're on a date, you know, like, I love this girl and she hates me, that's mind reading. Uh, There's also fortune telling is very common. Binary thinking, which I'm totally guilty of, um, is I have a tendency to think in terms of, like, it's going to be great or it's going to be horrible, which is, of course, most things are neither completely zero or completely one. Um, And it was interesting studying this stuff while I was dealing with free speech issues on campus because what I noticed was that I felt like administrators were engaged in behavior that seemed to be modeling um, cognitive distortions, Uh, a very exaggerated sense of threat, a very exaggerated sense of, you know, listen, if you don't do well here, you're kind of doomed. Um, And that at first I didn't notice that students were really picking up on this, but I feel like more recently, um, and unfortunately given the bad mental health outcomes we've seen really tick up just in the past couple of years, I'm afraid that students are to a degree, and this is what the book is largely about, learning the mental habits of anxious and depressed people. And and so let's take an example of this with a free speech issue. Somebody says something that's susceptible of two interpretations, and you're taking a a catastrophic interpretation, thinking that it is just saying something terrible about you, where you'd be better off kind of giving the speaker the benefit of the doubt, so to speak, and say, maybe it's not really about me. Is that, am am, am I on the right, right wavelength there? I would I would put that more in the category of just the old fashioned idea of benefit of the doubt, which I just uh-huh. think is good to create an environment where people can can talk. Uh, but from a uh, but from the CBT perspective, which uh, I know you know tons about uh, and studied a lot about as well, um, that the, the 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 catastrophizing is not as much. One of the things that's fun about the book is we try to show how kind of how useful it can be to use some of these guidelines for debating with each other. But it's primarily a technique that fundamentally is about debating with yourself. And part of what you're doing in, in that situation of, like, am I catastrophizing this, is not necessarily left letting the other person off the hook, but asking how much of your own mental space, anxiety, and angst you should give it. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with Greg Lukianoff about his book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Joe? Um Well, I want to now, in our last uh, segment here, Greg, go back to kind of solutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, one solution is we tell students, look, you're going to hear some things that are going to challenge you. They might be hard to hear, but we know you can take it. In fact, it'll it'll make you more informed. Um, How about other solutions? I mean, one question I have, Greg, is whether there are two very different kinds of speech and uh, that that students have to deal with. One is ideas that are hard but are presented in a kind of serious way. Um, and the other is the kind of rise, especially with the internet, of just a desire to hurt people through speech. And I wonder, right. are, there, are there different solutions for those two kinds of problems? I, I, I think so. Um, and definitely preparing people for 
um, difficult or uncomfortable ideas um, is you know you know one 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 part of the solution. I mean that's our uh, job in a sense as as professors is to present difficult ideas to our students that challenge them and force them to think about their own beliefs. But that would be different than saying to a particular student in class, you don't belong here. People like you don't belong here. Yeah. And that's something we talk about in the book as saying that uh, it, it's sort of a reciprocal duty that, you know, and we mean this as broadly as possible, particularly for the sake of the country. We, uh, we both have to try to give less offense and take less offense at the same time if we if we really want to make pro, uh, so, so, some progress here. Um, I do think that uh, some some in some ways though the, the interactions we see on on campus that are uh, you know particularly nasty or hurtful or hateful um, are nothing compared to the kind of things that you virtually can't uh, can't escape online. Um, so. Trying to figure out when something, first of all, when something isn't protected, when it's threats, when it's actual harassment, when it's um, uh, so a lot of the cases that get presented to us that involve um, some of the speech really would fit in the category of of harassment or, uh, for that matter, even libel. But when it comes to just someone, you know, being a kind of a jerk, uh, that's something that is, I think of as kind of one of the benefits of being in a genuinely diverse class, particularly if it's diverse in terms of people from different economic backgrounds, people from different uh, ethnic backgrounds. And what I mean by that is, like, I'll give the example of my own family. My dad's Russian, <laughs> and my mother is British. And when the relatives get together, my parents are divorced for very clear reasons, it's one sort of microaggression slash offense after the other. Um, and if you do your job at a, at a class with a class where you really do have people from different um, uh, different backgrounds, it's gonna probably mean that people are going to be insulting people unintentionally all the time, and maybe even intentionally sometimes because they have different ideas of the comparative value of uh, being brutally honest versus being polite, which is the distinction between Russian and, 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 and British that's very strong. Um, so there are times when you can intervene, but even for those interpersonal relationships, you can actually prepare people for the, the kind of more cosmopolitan idea that there are, peop there are people here who have completely different norms about uh, politeness than we might have at Stanford, and that you should you should give a shot of trying to hear what they're actually trying to say. You know, Greg, we had Claude Steele, one of the leading uh, African American academics, who's written about prejudice, out to the law school. And one of the things he recommended was having people work together on non-loaded issues. I mean, oh, this okay. is like bowling together uh, yeah. as a way of establishing trust. And I, I. I wonder if that's something that that makes sense to you, and I think I picked up a little of that in the book too. Yeah, I, th I think friendships, genuine friendships that have nothing to do with ideology, help so much. Um, one thing that I really appreciated about uh, the, my, my class, the class of 2000, um, was how diverse we were in so many different ways. And one of my best friends to this day was a guy who was a uh, was a uh, carpenter. For, for ten years before law school, and then went to, graduated from Stanford with me, did, did 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 fine, and then went back into carpentry, and he's you know very very happily living in in, in New York City, um, and I think that having people who could you know who could uh, organize around things, whether it's you know it can be everything from uh, uh, softball to Dungeons and Dragons to bowling. Um, it helps you understand that this person who has this ab this view you might find um, aberrational um, that they can still otherwise be a good person, which is which is a lesson that I think that um, we we unfortunately but desperately probably need to um, take as an entire society. Absolutely, very scary moment. <laughs> Abs <laughs> absolutely, Greg, and we so thank you for. Uh, 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 the interview, and also I think the book is a very interesting, subtle read that covers really a lot of American history, even though it focuses on the present and the problems of free speech on college campuses. Yeah, Greg, thank you so much for joining us, and thanks to our listeners for joining us on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121.